Hello, Void and all who inhabit it. It's me, and I'm tired of these fascists getting redeemed. Hi there. It's been not that long, um, but I have something to share. I'm, I'm kind of sensitive about it, but I'm a Marvel fan. And even worse, I really enjoy the Captain America branch of the MCU. I'm fascinated with the symbolism and the idolatry and the hypocrisy involved in crafting the idea of an American hero. I also think a lot of the actors are hot. So when the Falcon and the Winter Soldier was announced, I was in there like swimwear. And there's a lot to pull from that show. I'm recording this on the 23rd still it's 11 p.m but the finale came out today and girl there is a lot to pull from the show but ultimately i think it's a great amalgamation of all the ways modern hero stories struggle to handle complex ideas about morality and thus a great case study for our topic today i'm not going to turn this into a falcon and the winter soldier rant but if you could just for a moment walk with me here in episode four Sam, the hero and main protagonist, has a conversation with Carly, who is one of like three antagonists in the show and the leader of a group called the Flag Smashers who can best be described by their motto, one world, one people. International Robin Hood and her band of merry super soldiers on their way to radical villainy, basically. Anyway, the conversation starts with Sam saying, you're not making the world a better place if you're killing people, it's just different. And Carly responds that he's either brilliant or hopelessly optimistic. Later in this same conversation, Sam again brings up that she's killing innocent people, and Carly immediately replies that the people she killed weren't innocent and that she'd kill them again if she had to. Her response shocks them both, but it's Carly's shock at her own words as well as her refusal to answer Sam's question of who she's starting to sound like that suggests that Sam may be more brilliant than optimistic, that he may be right. Captain Dumbass soon charges in and ruins the moment, but this conversation is the point where Carly is open to finding a different way to achieve the same goal. However, Carly's fate has already been sealed, both in the previous episode when she initially chose violence and in an earlier scene that also takes place in episode four. Sam and Bucky, the secondary protagonist, are talking about Carly and Bucky says that her ends don't justify her means, that she's no better than Zemo or anyone else they fought against. And he says this scenes after bargaining for more time from the Dora Milaje, who want to take Zemo into custody so that Bucky and Sam can continue to benefit from Zemo's help. There is no acknowledgement in the hypocrisy in saying that these two people are the same while simultaneously being willing to work with one of them to track down the other. From these scenes, we are presented with two questions. How do you make the world a better place? And whose means are allowed to justify their ends? Often the answer to both of these are delivered in a binary of pure good and absolute evil. When stories attempt to add more nuance, they tend to trend towards absolving villains, but usually only a specific type of villain and often with a little effort on their part. Enter Kyle Ron, AKA Kylo Ren, AKA Ben Solo. His end is but a recent example of the very old trope of the redemptive sacrifice. This trope suggests that a final ultimate decision can absolve you of all wrongdoing, regardless of whether or not you had been atoning or working to change. It seems like it's adding nuance to the idea of pure good and absolute evil, but it's really just having a character swing from one end to the other without diving into why or how, let alone addressing all the bad shit they just did. You can contrast the treatment of a character like Kylo Ren with the treatment of a character like Killmonger, who is a morally gray antagonist at first. He's saying things that make you think, mm, maybe he's kind of right, before he gets catapulted into villainy. I've mentioned before, but DJ Ben Amin of For All Nerds has coined the term killmongering a character to describe when an agreeable antagonist does something egregiously awful to rip away the audience's sympathy. They are pushed headfirst into the absolute evil end of the spectrum with little to no hope of redemption. In this trope, we also often get the idea of don't let them make you the villain. Don't do the thing that'll make it easier for us all to hate you. A recent example also in Marvel occurred in WandaVision, but Wanda is exonerated in the end by Monica, 
in a way that feels both disingenuous to that character and to the theme of actions impacting perceptions that runs throughout the show. Though Wanda's actions are perceived differently, mostly negatively, by those around her, I bring up how she's treated in the end not because it fits this idea of being killmongered, but because it highlights the extreme struggle to understand the difference between redemption and atonement. Princess Weeks did a really good video on redemption a couple of months ago, it'll be linked below, and in it she references a lot more rounded examples of how villains can atone and eventually be redeemed if they need to be at all. The only way to really get better and change is to have your actions reflect that. So we're looking for one big giant moment to encompass everything rather than looking at the small moments that indicate that people are growing. We also have a larger issue of understanding that we don't have to make excuses for enjoying villain protagonists. It is okay to enjoy the bad guy. In media, this idea of absolute good or complete bad leads to villains being marked as good now without having them address what they did that was harmful in the past. The conflict is that because of this lack of nuance, morally ambiguous or agreeable antagonists are very easily chucked into the irredeemable pile. Instead of pulling them apart over time, it's easier to have them do one big act that pushes them over the edge. But there are still some villains and antagonists who are able to skirt the consequences of their actions for little to no reason. Additionally, this avoidance of consequences is happening less often through major redemptive sacrifice and more so through moments where antagonists are willing to help protagonists as a means of temporary redemption. Plus, there is a continuing trend of audiences admiring or adoring antagonists who are shown as relatable or funny throughout this helpful moment and using that relatability as the means to absolve them. Meanwhile, the person hasn't really changed or grown. Which brings me to Baron Frank Zemo. I think his treatment in The Falcon and the Winter Soldier is really similar to Mayfield's in the second season of The Mandalorian, but cranked up. I keep bringing up Marvel and Star Wars characters, but you can see a similar setup across media from Harry Potter to Once Upon a Time to Power Rangers to YouTube beauty guru drama. There will be an instance where someone who would ordinarily be seen as an antagonist does something good or helps someone they'd normally be in conflict with. Though plenty pieces of media use this as the first step in an eventual character change, shout out to Regina Mills, the audience takes it further by supporting that antagonist ahead of time, which often means that the antagonist doesn't have to go through a full redemption arc because audiences are eager to accept them immediately. In this, the one good act has a similar effect as a redemptive sacrifice in providing lightning fast forgiveness. But just like the redemptive sacrifice, this one good act doesn't actually absolve anyone of past behavior, especially if this character or person goes to be back on their bullshit because, surprise, they didn't actually atone or change. What I think makes the one good act more effective is that on top of it, there is the layer of humanizing the antagonist in a way that's similar to the pet the dog trope. The pet the dog trope is when a villain or antagonist is shown doing something kind, often to someone who can't repay them, such as petting a dog, as a means to humanize that character. More than kindness, we are shown humorous behavior or attempts at being friendly as a way to demonstrate that, hey, maybe this person isn't so bad. However, hey, maybe they aren't so bad, often is a fast track to redemptionville and love for a character who was a villain or actively harming others the last time we heard or saw from them with little work done to address that part. As I was writing this, the hashtag release the Zemo cut started trending on Twitter. After an article was published revealing that the club scene in episode 3 had been longer, loads of viewers flocked to the internet to beg for more footage of a mass murdering terrorist fist bumping to Sandstorm. And you know, beyond the typical fandom racism that leads to woobifying every white character possible, especially white men, as soon as possible, the writers are actively encouraging this kind of reaction. It isn't solely headcanons or fan fiction that are rewriting these characters. 
It's the story itself saying, maybe the revamped Nazi character is actually someone to sympathize with and enjoy. General Hux is an excellent example of so many terrible things, but his one good act is a prime example of a character whose morality does not shift at all despite perception from the audience. And if anything, his one good act was empty fan service to fuel that shifted perspective. His end goal is aligned with Finn and Poe's, but Hux's last words to the First Order are, I don't care if you win, I just need Kylo Ren to lose. His decision to help the resistance is very much the enemy of my enemy is my friend type of shit. But having a goal that overlaps or runs parallel to the protagonist does not mean that this character has been redeemed or held accountable for their behavior or is even doing something that makes sense for their development thus far. Just because the antagonist has a shared goal does not mean they now have a shared vision or set of values or even similar reasonings for this one specific objective, nor does it mean their separate rationales are something to sympathize with or see as good. Often a shared goal is immediately equated to a shared set of values even when that's explicitly not true. And this is done both by the audience and by the writers. On the flip side, moments where the hero is willing to accept help from the bad guy are rarely taken as opportunities to explore a slip in the hero's morality. The Falcon and the Winter Soldier is not pushing viewers to question Bucky or Sam's willingness to partner with Zemo as what that means for them and their moral compasses. Considering that the help Zemo is providing arguably could have been sourced from literally anyone else, partnering with him is a deliberate choice that the show then does not examine. Instead, we have moments where Zemo says things that seem like, whoa, he gets it. And it fucking cheeses me that Zemo's character, both from the comics to the cinematic universe and within the cinematic universe, has been rewritten so strategically to get us to like him, even as his motivations and means have not really changed or become better. It's at this point that I think it's a good time to ask, what separates a hero from a villain? To me, there are three key things. Your goals, what is it you want to do? Your motivation, why do you want to do it? And your means, how are you going to achieve this goal? Morality starts to get blurry when two opposing forces start to share one of the three. We may both want to get rid of the emperor or find the power broker or deplatform James Charles, but our reason why, the motivation behind our behavior, is usually what deems us a hero or a villain in the story. Clouding that distinction or being unwilling to explore complex motivations is what makes stories so restricted by compounding the idea of a set good and bad. The idea that someone is one or the other, whether now or forever, is then used as the main lens to view their behavior. A rigid morality also allows a suggestion that you can swing from one side to the other with one action because it's not really the act that matters but whose side you're on when you do it. When Sam is killing people for the US military, it's okay. But when Carly blows up a building to send a message, it's deplorable. They're using similar means to carry out their goals, but it's the goal they're aiming to achieve that justifies their actions in the narrative. The story doesn't care about the how, but the what. We're all doing illegal shit here, but my illegal behavior is for a better cause than yours. So I can condemn your actions while continuing my own very similar behavior. Meanwhile, the why, which I would argue is the most important aspect, is the aspect that can shift your how and your what loses influence in the story along the way. This often contradictory and inconsistent way of determining who is good and bad underscores the importance of characters like Nakia from Black Panther, who shows that there is a way to merge two opposing ideas, that there is space in between, and that one doesn't have to solely choose an end to defend. Something really interesting about Sam in The Falcon and the Winter Soldier is that he is the Nakia. He is trying to find the space in between, but both sides tell him that if he's not working for them, He's not necessarily working against them, but he's certainly not striving for anything fruitful or possible. Sam is on a fool's errand for trying to find a way to mediate. 
but there is in fact much gray to operate within and so many ideas and behaviors beyond I'm right and you're wrong. But few pieces of media are willing to explore the tangled web of morality with fidelity. Instead, what we have is a simplified sense of morality that ultimately makes it easy for former antagonists to be on the side of right despite all the wrong they've done. You don't have to be held accountable for what you've done wrong or the ways that you've harmed other people because in this moment you're doing something to help the right side achieve their end goal so we can forget about that temporarily. The biggest reason why this is able to work, this rigid sense of morality that allows the utilization of villains for the right cause, is because of an unwillingness to look at our heroes as grayer than we believe them to be. The Falcon and the Winter Soldier did poke a little bit at this idea of good guys being validated in everything they do with John Walker, but they're only willing to do that because we aren't supposed to like him, at least for the first five episodes of the series. John Walker will never be Captain America the way Steve was because being Cap, in the interpersonal sense, not the ideological propaganda sense, isn't about the suit or the shield or the serum, it's about your values. It's about consistently putting yourself on the line to help the little guy even if you ain't that far from little yourself. We see in Sam Wilson someone who is willing to put others first time and time again. And that's why he's a better option to fill the gap that Steve left behind than John Walker could ever hope to be. But the gag is, a lot of the purpose of Captain America as an ideological figure, a lot of these modern depictions of heroes, is to be more like John Walker than Sam Wilson. We are presented characters with titles and outfits and powers that mean they should be able to act with impunity, and the stories they're in don't challenge that because we're supposed to still like these characters at the end. And apparently that can't happen if they're held accountable. So if this is the idea of the hero that we're operating with, if a villain decides to help them, the villain has to be right too. The villain has to be good too, at least in this moment. Because if they're not, and if they don't eventually stab the hero in the back and show they were only willing to help so far as it helped them, what does that mean about our hero? What does this mean about how they're trying to achieve their goal? Much of morality, at least in fictional media, is completely determined by whose goals you are helping to achieve. It doesn't matter why, and it often doesn't matter how, as long as you are on the right side. But whose side is right? Mari from Geek Remix had tweeted out, You ever think about how supervillains are always trying to change the world and superheroes maintain the status quo? Which made me think of the values we are taught through media in general, but also this trend of bringing back toothless antagonists to aid heroes. The characters who once wanted to inspire a huge change are now satisfied with preventing one. It also made me question, what is the purpose of these stories anymore? We believe that the victors write history, but who is writing our fantasies? Comics have a long tradition of being a platform for more radical or progressive thought, but as they've shifted over to the screen, a lot of that has been lost. The idea of social criticism and superhero stories specifically being watered down or completely flipped isn't a new observation. I found an article from 1990 where the author was talking about how social criticism in comics gets negatively impacted as distributors change. But this idea of comic book social commentary or social commentary in media in general being dimmed runs parallel to the rise of consumer culture, which was initially influenced by modernism. Modernism was an art and philosophical-ish movement that centered, among other things, the potential for individual impact. In art, this led to abstract art and jazz and stream of consciousness novels. As a philosophy, modernism was a bit radical. It was a rejection of tradition and an emphasis on the need for political self-consciousness. This movement rose in popularity during and after both world wars, which was also when capitalist and industrial developments in countries were becoming more powerful. As a result, by the 1960s, modernism, and specifically the idea of modernity, 
and capitalism started to be associated together. And for good reason, because the creation of a consumer culture through capitalism led to a mainstream takeover of what was once avant-garde. So the once revolutionary idea of disregarding tradition in favor of individual innovation gets warped to government propaganda, gets warped to the rejection of the welfare state and of social safety nets, gets warped into an institutionalized way of favoring the private sector over the public one. What does this have to do with heroes, villains, or morality? Great question. In his article, but what can anyone do about it? Modernism, superheroes, and the unfinished business of the common good, author Andrew Hoberick talks about the early evolution of superheroes as figures who accepted modernity, things like technology and innovation, but who rejected the modernist ideal of individualism. Hoberick references an early work of Siegel and Schuster, the creators of Superman, entitled The Reign of Superman. Five years before Clark Kent, there was Bill Dunn, a regular degular dude who gained powers after being tested on by a chemist. What makes Dunn different from Kent, however, are his intentions with this power. Dunn defies the chemist not in order to fight evil, but to amass a fortune and seek world domination himself, a plan that only fails when the element responsible for his power wears off. In 1938, when Siegel and Schuster created the Superman we know today, they changed his motivation to be someone more interested in fighting for the common good than for individual gain, a desire that goes directly against the later modernist distrust of a welfare state and widespread community intervention. As modernist slash capitalist ideas of the power of the individual were gaining more popularity, Siegel and Schuster and other early comic creators established an industry full of heroes who fought for the good of the group. The idea of using your extraordinary abilities for others instead of just yourself is a conflict baked into the essence of many superhero stories. But when fighting for the good of the group meant fighting against villains who so blatantly mirrored the real life forces threatening the country and the potential progression of capitalism, these stories were allowed to thrive as they were, as racist as they were at times. But as the world has changed and modernism has been remixed to the point of neoliberalism, this genre has been expected to not only shift mediums, but to redesign the motivations and archetypes of characters that have existed for decades to serve a new set of values. While modernist art espoused philosophical ideas that were warped when repeated in a governing sense, neoliberalist economic theory has had the opposite trajectory, impacting the creation of art and culture as a whole. This influence has shifted which rationales are seen as worthy and also re-legitimized more individualist motives. Zemo in the MCU wanting to avenge his family makes him more redeemable than Zemo in the comics who wants to take over the world in the name of a supremacist ideology. General Huck saying, I don't care if you win, I just want Kylo Ren to lose, shows that he isn't invested in the collective betterment, but he isn't invested in the collective failure either. He has an individual goal focused on the downfall of an individual person, which makes him seem less evil than when he was willing to destroy a whole planet a movie ago, apparently. I don't think Kylo Ren's motivation is all that clear at the end of the sequel trilogy, but whether he sacrificed himself to help Rey or to destroy Palpatine or both, his action is similarly rooted in a limited self-interested motivation. These antagonists aren't shown as wanting to harm everyone, just a choice few. And though that goal often has a lot of collateral damage, for some reason, they are made less evil in this way. They are a bit more hero-like in that sense too, like, Sorry for killing thousands, I was just trying to stop Ultron or whatever. Ubu, please don't have the UN sanction me. Examining the shift from modernism to neoliberalism and the impact of consumer culture and capitalism also pokes deeper at the values pushed in modern hero stories. It's not just, we have to make a story that sells, but what you perceive as a story that sells, what stories you are even allowing to be introduced into the market in the first place. We can see a difference in which values allow villains to be redeemed without atonement or change, even if temporarily, and which ones push villains to be radicalized past the point of salvation. 
this switch in condemned values also pushes the idea that the redeemable villains and antagonists aren't so bad because they just want to do something for themselves. Again, they're not trying to harm everyone, even if their process results in a lot of harm. Also, I want to point out, because it applies, that you could factor identity markers of these characters into their treatment as well. I don't think it's a coincidence that white and specifically white male characters are allowed to make decisions that impact and harm multiple people, yet still get to be pulled back or portrayed as worth care and affection, while characters of color not only are not given the same amount of flexibility, but are also marked as a greater danger to more people. I think there's a deeper ideological issue at play here as well, but the way villainy manifests is probably also purposeful and worth noting. There is an insidious part of this shift in which values are villainized in the deliberate choice to rewrite characters who were once allegories of harmful ideologies to be more self-interested as a way to disarm them. It's not only a way to legitimize their remixed goals but also to say that the ideologies we should be afraid of are those revolutionary ones over there. I just want to be clear that both of these mindsets, the more individually focused ones and the more wide sweeping ones, can be destructive. But there is a different impact when we only consider one as absolutely irredeemable no matter the circumstance. We lose a lot of the original benefit of comic stories as progressive cultural commentary when writers are unable or unwilling to equally examine multiple types of harm that exists in our society. One of the super frustrating things about the end of The Falcon and the Winter Soldier is Sam's speech in the end where he says, this girl was willing to die to fight you and nobody has asked why. That same line could be shouted at the writer's room that haphazardly crafted Carly and her crew as directionless criminals in the end. Y'all are not really willing to look into and to condemn the conditions that would lead to the creation of someone like Carly, and certainly not in the same episode that is asking us to find joy in moments with John Walker and Zemo. A lot of the ideological examination we could have is narrowed down, and as a result, there's a narrowing down of how audiences are engaging with this media. Like, for example, Thanos. We all can agree, hopefully, that Thanos was a villain, but the eugenics part of his plan flew over a lot of people's heads. It's not just the magnitude of what Thanos wants to do that's bad, but the idea that there is one person who can decide whose lives are worthy of continuing that's at the root of his evilness. A lot of these villains who are being reworked to be soft boys are characters who believed or fit the archetype of someone who would believe in something similar. Shedding that motivation in favor of this flip to completely demonize more revolutionary antagonists without also consistently condemning the bad behavior of the rewritten characters is harmful. A different example showing how storytellers encourage this kind of narrow consumption of media as well Keeping in Marvel, there is a reoccurring theme in Marvel movies of conflict being centered around the, the creation of a global security and surveillance system. It happens in Captain America Winter Soldier with Project Insight, it happens in Age of Ultron with Ultron, and it happened most recently in WandaVision with the creation of Project Cataracts aka white vision. All three of these ideas are meant to serve as a way to have continuous surveillance of the entire world, right? But we are told that one idea is better than the other for different reasons, but they're all essentially the same idea. And what Marvel does is avoid poking at the undergirding connecting theme between Captain America Winter Soldier and Age of Ultron and WandaVision, which is a desire for one country or one entity to be able to police the entire world. That is the connecting theme between all three of these. When it's Nazis who want to do it, it's bad. But when it's Tony Stark who wants to do it, it's not bad until that method he wants to employ gains sentience and figures that, oh, the threat is all of humanity. So, 
Thanos Senpai notice me, I'm gonna wipe them all out for you ahead of time. The impact of having a global surveillance weapon doesn't even really register in the list of concerns for WandaVision the way that it did with Age of Ultron and definitely not the way that it did with Captain America Winter Soldier. As we've progressed, Captain America Winter Soldier came out in 2014, I think. So over seven years of storytelling, Marvel has revisited this conflict at least three times and each time moves further and further away from the undergirding uncomfortable idea of having a global surveillance and security unit that is controlled by one body. We are becoming desensitized to the behavior and ideologies these same stories would have warned us against. In the end, stories that no longer present individualism as a negative value, plus the idea of heroes maintaining the status quo, plus media not just being impacted by culture, but by distribution restrictions, results in a media landscape where villains who have selfish motivations can be redeemed or be temporary associates or resources for the hero, but villains whose motivations are a bit more radical or more closely aligned to a desire to pull resources, attention, and energy towards a wider scope of impacting more people can never be brought back. If your culture values the individual over the group, why wouldn't that be reflected in how heroes get to win? Which former enemies they may be willing to work with and which ones they'll never consider helping? If you teach consumers to care about the collective as opposed to investing in a few elite individuals, then you're spreading an idea that can influence people to be less selfish. And selfishness is how capitalism thrives. Well, that and cutting as many corners to make as much money as possible and calling it innovation. Regardless, the idea through heroes and the villains they are willing to redeem is that you as an individual can operate outside of a system if it's for the greater good. And that even with a partner or a team, your individual acts are more powerful and more important than the actions of the collective group. Those who look to impact the collective or who look to hold the elite individuals accountable for having failed to meet the needs of the collective that weren't considered or cared about, they're the real danger. Story after story tells us that if you beat the big bad, all will be well. But if you can convince them to join you, even for a moment, you've achieved something greater. The antagonists that are willing to fight with you are the ones worthy of something more, regardless of whether or not they've actually changed. But the ones who continue to push back, the ones who suggest that maybe an aspect of their fight is just or worse than an aspect of your fight is unjust, well, fuck them. They're a lost cause. They don't understand. They're unwilling to bend for the right things. All of this takes us back to one of the questions I asked in the beginning. Whose means are allowed to justify their ends? Heroes making choices that sit right with them individually, that allow them to move freely and without restriction, are means that can be justified because their end goal is still the greater good. Also, characters with individual goals, such as wanting to destroy one specific person or set of people, can have their methods be justified as well. And as long as their goal doesn't threaten the greater good, they can be allowed to pop up in a franchise again and again. So if you're allowed to fight, if your end has been justified, how then do you make the world a better place? You use whatever you have available. You convince more people to remain complacent. You avoid questioning harmful systems in favor of condemning individuals. You neglect to consider how one of those methods benefits you more than the other. You accept that the greater good is a very specific type of stability and that achieving it means keeping a lot of things the same, means partnering with those who will aid your cause and denouncing those who won't regardless of either believes in it, means refusing to consider where you may be wrong. And you don't stop to ask, who are you making the world better for? If you made it to the end, thank you for making it to the end. They shoot fireworks, girl. Does this make sense? 
I'm basically trying to say that capitalism is ruining everything, but in a very specific way to push very specific values that are ruining stories that could be great explorations into how morality is not easy or clear cut or even consistently distributed across people. Like, even in what I'm saying, that villains with more revolutionary ideas or who have goals that impact the collective being labeled as irredeemable at a higher rate, that doesn't mean that every antagonist who fits into that bucket should be now automatically redeemed, you know? Like, Thanos and his goal pulls directly from eugenics ideology. He shouldn't get the Kylo Ren treatment just because he's looking to impact more people than himself. That's why the why behind characters' goals are so important. We lose so much when we just say someone is good or bad based on who they're working with and we don't consider why any of these people are doing any of this stuff in the first place and how that impacts not just what they're doing but how they're trying to do it. Anyway, I need to calm down. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go watch the Golden Girls or something. Child, try to stop thinking about this Marvel show that's giving me gray hairs anyway um until next time stay safe i'll catch you in the next echo chamber